Evening, ladies and gents, it's Simon Brown here uh, for this evening's presentation from Keith McLaughlin from smallcaps.coza and from Tebe Securities. I'm going to hand over to Keith McLaughlin. As I said, small caps, go have a check. His site went live this week. I don't know if it's, I think it's what he calls a soft launch. He's not telling anyone. So uh, I'll stick it out there. The site's there. Go have a look, see. Well worth it. Uh, over to Keith. Hi, guys. Uh, this evening I'm going to chat about uh, profitability. If you remember last time we spoke, uh, we were looking at fundamentals, specifically equities fundamentals, um, and, and I gave them four pillars, which is uh, profitability, solvency, liquidity, and management. Um, tonight is obviously we're looking at profitability. Um, moving forward, so what are profits? It, it's simple. Business is motivated by profits. No one goes into business for any any other reason. Um, so uh, something right now that may sound abstract, but uh, I, I want to dwell on it, and it's going to make sense as we go through the presentation, is that and what I define profit says is two times inputs equals three times outputs. The inputs being the cost into the business and the outputs being the revenues. Hence, you're left with the surplus, which is one, and that's that's profits. In essence, profit is the profit is the reward for a efficient and effective business. Okay, now uh, fundamentals always tie down to numbers. Um, numbers are companies report. Uh, there's there's three statements. Yeah, you know, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. This is uh, the income statement is now called the statement of comprehensive income because if it's decided they they need to make everyone's lives just a little bit more difficult. Um, this this is a very very simple sample uh, income statement. What I've done is I've highlighted uh, the outputs as greens and the inputs as reds. If you remember, two times inputs equals three times outputs, and that's profit. Um, you'll notice revenue is in green. Cost of sale is in red because you had to buy the products. You're left with you're left with the surplus, which is a gross profit. What you need your overheads, operating expenses, take out your financing charges. There's always sovereignty uh, sovereignty cost for operating in the economy, which we call tax, and you're left with net profit. So all the red. You'll notice there's only one line item that's green, and that's revenue sales. Sales is a critical critical number to understand when it comes to profitability, but not just sales how you get there, and these costs are all how you get there. So let's start on the, on the income statement and work, work our way down uh, to understand profitability and, uh, uh, and how it interacts with the business. Um, the very first line is revenue. See it in green there? It's, it's the input. If, if there's only one thing you understand about a business, understand what drives its sales. Whether they're growing, declining, um, yeah, volumes to prices because there's a difference between volumes and prices. Um, so it, it's critical. You, you've got to understand what's driving sales. Um, in in um, yeah, a good example, the automotive sector, income uh, interest rates drop. Uh, it's cheap to buy a car. Um, yeah, the population is growing. There's more young people, more people coming to the market, turning 18, getting their licenses, needing cars. Just as the interest rates are dropping, you know, the sales drivers are all coming coming to the forefront. Um, as opposed, you you maybe for example a gold miner, or actually even better, let's make it a uranium miner. Just when the price crashes, uh, Japan's had a disaster. Um, uh, nuclear power is being being questioned. You've, you've got to understand those sales drivers. That gives you an idea for going forward. What's what's going to be coming? Uh, how is how it's going to be growing or declining? Because sales are the only only cash inputs really coming into a business. So the questions you have to ask: first of all, what's driving sales? And second of all, does the business have pricing power, or is it a price taker? Pricing power is a very simple concept. Um, do they have the ability to raise the prices? And if they raise the prices, will they lose volumes? Have a look at the retailers. Uh, South African retailers are a good example of, of guys that don't actually ha really have pricing power. It's so competitive. If you're selling bread for one rand cheaper than somebody else's, everyone's going to buy your bread, basically. 
um, and vice versa. If you hark, you start hiking the uh, the amount that you're charging for for that, um, everyone's going to go go somewhere else. Um, well, going back to uranium miner or gold miner, they they the classic um, they're the classic price taker because well you suddenly need that spot. If you try to sell gold higher than spot, everyone's going to laugh at you and just going to buy it on the open market. Um, but, but then down to uh, pricing power, you know, have a look at Apple. Um, Apple is a good example of a company that has pricing power. It's the, it's the inherent power of their brand. You know, compare the iPad versus you know the Galaxy versus all, all the other all the other um, tablet computing platforms, and you know Apple charges quite a quite a premium onto their products. So but that's because Apple has a couple of unique advantages. Hence, they have pricing power. And then a final, I just want to touch on demographics of sales. Uh, Data Tech came out with their results today, and they're a good example of demographics of sales. Uh, they're selling, yes, they're selling technology. They're selling hardware and mostly Cisco-related technology, but they're selling it to a range of, uh, of uh, countries. Each each you know, a sales mix has has its own risks. First of all, are they selling more software? Or are they selling more hardware? Well, they have they have Cisco, which is more hardware. So you, you have to understand that you know the underpinning of what hardware is. Then, which which uh, geographies are they selling it in? Quite literally, who are they selling it to? You know, they have a huge amount in the US. They have a huge amount in the UK. So yeah, if if you understand, if, if you have a limited amount of time. And you want to understand sales and, and sales being the most single most important thing on the income statement, being the thing that is beyond everything else, uh, if everything stays constant, driving profitability, then understand, first of all, what the major component of sales is. Because every business sells a range of products or services. What's, what's the major contributor to sales? Then understand whether they have pricing power or they're a price taker. And then understand the demographics of sales. Right, having looked at sales, we have, obviously the next step in the process is to look at how much sales cost to be made. Yeah, uh, you uh, buy bread at Spa, how much do you buy for, say, I don't know how much bread costs these days, 5, 10 rand, but Spa, it costs them for 8 rand to, to produce. So uh, that's on a very basic level, uh, cost of sales. It's, um, yeah, okay, we just spoke about the, uh, the retailer model. Um, the costs will tend to be variable, and costs tend to be variable when our companies are resellers, as opposed to manufacturers, miners, or services. Um, resellers will be buying the product from somebody else and then redistributing it. Whereas you're looking at services, manufacturing companies, you're looking at uh, mining companies, their costs are relatively fixed. The, the, the marginal cost of selling is, is, is actually quite low. Um, so, but also a large uh, component of, well, cost of sales is essentially a variable cost. Variable cost means that as sales grow, cost of sales will grow often in proportion. Largely in proportion, but not always. And that depends on pricing power. You see, if you can grow your revenue faster, then you can grow your cost of sales. Uh, it falls straight down to your gross, uh, gross profit, and that often falls straight down to your net profit. So uh, it, it may not sound like much, but if, if Pick and Pay managed to raise their gross profit by 1%, you know, it's, it's more than likely their, 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 their net profit would you know, uh, go up by multiples, many, many, many multiples of that. And it's just because a huge component of that business is nothing more than variable costs sitting in cost of sales. The next line item on the income statement is operating expenses. Now, whereas the, the costs that are directly, di directly attributable to revenue are often captured in IFRS in the cost of sales, um, the costs that aren't attributable to, um, the operating costs that aren't attributable directly attributable to revenue are often captured in uh, operating expenses. It, it, it sounds complicated what I've just said, but it, it's very simple. Often, your variable costs are sitting in cost of sales. They will track revenue. And as opposed to that, your fixed costs are often sitting in operating expenses. Um, now, I, I know my previous example, I was chatting about uh, you know, retailers. 
where it's, it's all about managing these two lines, revenue versus cost of sales. And then, then I mentioned services industry or the mining industry. Services is a good example of, of, of company, you know, they often have a high amount of operating expenses because they have to hire staff. They need admin staff, they need support staff, um, even their unallocated staff who aren't on a project earning money and they, they can't assign it will be sitting in operating expenses. So operating expenses, once you've taken out cost of sales, from revenue, you're sitting with gross profit. Once you've taken out operating expenses, you're sitting with operating profit. Operating profit and, and the relationship between the change in operating profit and the change in revenue is, is what we call operating leverage. Now, if operating leverage is higher, is, is very, very high, then uh, one percentage change in revenue will, for example, have a greater than one percentage change in operating profit. But operating profit also works negatively. If, if, if revenue drops by less, by 1%, then operating profit is going to drop by more than 1%. Um, it's, it's maybe a, a, a yeah, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking in vague principles here. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, you hire, you decide to sell hamburgers. Um, you have a father who's a butcher and a mother who's a baker, so you get your buns and rolls and everything free. In other words, your cost of sales is zero. But you have to hire a stand to sell those hamburgers. And the stand costs you 10 rand per day. So if you're selling the hamburgers at one rand, uh, that's your revenue item. You sell 10 hamburgers because your cost of sales is zero because you're well connected. Um, your Gross, gross profit will be 10, but your cost, your operating cost is fixed. It's your, it's your uh, hamburger stand and that costs you 10 rand. So you've actually made an operating level, operating profit, you made zero. But then you notice how suddenly if you sell one more hamburger, that one rand drops straight down to operating profit. If you sold 20 hamburgers, um, so, uh, so 10 hamburgers, you're making zero profit at 11 hamburgers, you're suddenly making one rand profit. That's an infinite increase in profits. But let's take it to 20 hamburgers. From 11 hamburgers to 20 hamburgers, suddenly you're making 20 rand profit. Uh, the revenue, your revenue has doubled, but your operating profit has gone up. What is that? That is a uh, thousand percent. And that, that is what we, when we're talking about operating leverage, uh, that's what we're talking about. Right, m moving on, um, you need to understand how financing affects profits. Just as we've spoken about operating leverage, you also get a concept called financial leverage. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because our, our next two uh, webinars where we look at uh, solvency and then liquidity do touch on this aspect, and, and then I'll have one off there where I bring them all together. But in essence, the same thing when I told you about uh, operating expenses often being fixed, Often your financing charges are too. You've taken out, say for example, you didn't you you didn't hire that a hamburger stand. You actually bought it, but you took out a loan. So you're paying interest and you're paying that loan back. That's financing charges. That's where it falls down. Um, so if you if you sell X amount of burgers, um, say ten burgers. Well, there's no, because you own the stand, there's no longer operating expenses. Actually, there'll be depreciation, but I want to keep it simple. So you sell 10 hamburgers, uh, fall straight down to operating profits, you have 10 rand. But then your finance charges, let's say, for, uh, to keep things simple, are 5 rand. So you've, you've got a profit before tax of 5 rand. Um, once again, do you notice how, when, if I change the amount of revenue, if you sell more and more and more and more hamburgers, it's not going to change your finance charges. So it all just falls straight down to profit before tax. Hence, the higher the financial leverage, the greater the company is exposed to change in sales. And you can actually combine these two leverages uh, and to get total leverage. But th this is perhaps taking it a little too far. The only point I want to touch on here is to understand that there is operating leverage, there is financial leverage, um, and both of these Make, make a company extre extremely, the profitability of a company, extremely exposed to changes in sales. 
Um, and when it comes to financial leverage, particularly, it's driven by solvency and liquidity. Then we get on to tax. <laughs> Everyone's favorite question. Now, you, in the, in the income statement, there's, there's a, there's a line item they call deferred, deferred tax, often bundled in with actual tax paid. And, and the reality is it's, it's a matching entry. It's a, it's a, it's IFRS and accounting trying to, um, sort of smooth cash flow payments and things like that. I'm not going to get into that. That is beyond beyond the level of this course. Just be aware of that. Um, understand that in the long term, deferred tax, actual tax, and effective tax should all meet each other. So in essence, in South Africa, where the corporate tax rate is 28%, your, your deferred tax being a timing entry, um, it, it doesn't really matter. For, for effective forecasting purposes and things, you can, you can, you can take 28% plus STC, bear in mind if the company pays dividends. Um, dividends are changing, um, whereas the company would take the expense. Now you are, in essence, taking the expense because the company is taking withholding tax from you. So from the 1st of January 2012, there's a 10% dividend tax, and it will no longer appear in the income statement. It will just be a cash flow item. This, this is specific to South Africa, but... Um, it's 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 also reality. So you need to take this into account when looking at South African companies. The most important thing in tax is is really to look at whether the company is um, how much tax they're paying. Look at the effective tax rate, which is simple. It's tw this 12 here divided by the 45 there. We get in the, uh, the effective tax rate um, gives you an indication of how tax efficient the company is because there's sometimes there's quite unique tax incentives or in this case in the mining sector there's um, unique taxes to the mining sector royalty taxes and things like that actually boost the, 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 the um, effective tax rate so we, we worked our way through the income statement we obviously left with net profit net profit is the, is the motive it is it is the be all and end all of business in the long term in the short term you can be building up to it all yeah, but look, look in the normalized long term. Profit is profit is always what uh, what motivates things. Now, what percentage at the end of the day after after you've you've um, tapped your mother and father for free buns and um, burgers, you've you know you've bought your you've bought your uh, hamburger stand, you've financed that, you've sold burgers until the sun sets all over the weekend. At the end of it all you're left with net profit, and that is why you did that. Now, what percentage of sales is that net profit? And what percentage of all the other levels of the income statement with the different operating leverages? This gives you an idea for how competitive a business is. That's why we talk about, in the grand scheme of things, we talk about margins. Now, margins, I have a pet hate for people when they just quote margins. The problem is there's so many ranges of margins. You get gross profit margin, you get operating profit margin, you get net profit margin, you get EBITDA margin, and I can go on and on and on. The trick is to understand what margin we're talking about. The margin magic formula is simple. It's whatever profit item divided by revenue. So what percentage of revenue falls straight down that income statement to that, to that profit item? Uh, profit line. And the interesting thing to understand margins is is, to, is that revenues is, is a direct sales force. That's how you uh, that's how you drive the business. But understand that uh, with a lot of your fixed costs, the costs often dictate margins. So uh, look, looking at that, understanding that margins are are, are essentially a firm's competitiveness and their interaction between the sales and the cost base of, of that company, um, the wider the margin, the better. That said, be very careful of leverage. In, in a bull market, the economy is booming, sales are, are, are roaring ahead. Companies take, often take on much more either operating or financial or both leverage than they can. So on the bottom line, profits are growing fantastically at, at, at amazing multiples. But understand, that's why you have to look at the, the leverage in that business to understand the risk. Because when the downturn comes and business goes in cycles, there's never just, there's never just an up and there's never just a down. So, 
as, as so in, in the bull market, the margins look fantastically wide, but view them in context of the leverage. And it gives you an understanding of competitiveness versus risk within the business. It gives you an overall view. Now, the, the magic number that companies always quote, and the JSC requires sends a trading updates when, when this particular number differs by 20% within any, any reporting period, is the earnings per share. There are as many earnings per share as, as we have time to talk. Uh, the critical one is basic earnings per share and headline earnings per share. And how, how do we calculate that? It's, it's simple. The earnings per share is net profit divided by the number of ordinary shares. Now, net profit we've just spoken about, but we haven't spoken about the number of ordinary shares. And this is why when companies, this, this is actually a good example when we talk about dilution. If the net profit stays fixed, but we increase the number of shares, do you notice how the earnings per share will drop? Because the denominator has just increased. Um, whereas the, a company does a big acquisition, they add on, say, they double their profits. But their acquisition was very expensive and they quadruple the number of ordinary shares. You notice how even though the profit has gone up, the number of ordinary shares has increased even more. So your earnings per share level, which is direct, directly attribu attributable to uh, your shareholders, you being a shareholder buying the stock on the, on the market, it's actually taking profits away from you, that acquisition. Dilution is a permanent cost and it is, it is painful. Be very aware of that and particularly look at, there's also an earnings per share measure called dilute earnings per share. So now we talk about issued shares versus weighted shares. In essence, issued shares are the, if the company is liquidated right now, it's how many shares they have to pay out to. Weighted shares is simple. When you're calculating earnings per share and you've issued cash for, um, for equity or you, you bought a business and you've issued shares for it, it only contributes to a part of the year. Yeah, business happens continuously. It doesn't start and stop at the end of each financial year. So what you do to, to, to match profits versus the financing of profits, of which equity is part, they weight the shares for how many shares have been issued throughout the year. Weighted shares is what calculates basic earnings per share. Then, as I noted earlier, dilution is the true cost of equity. If you're spending money in your hamburger business and there's no need to, uh, and you, uh, you're paying everything, you're making lots of profits, you're happy with the growth potential and everything, there's no need to issue shares. The moment you issue shares, you have to share that profit. And that's what dilution is. Just uh, assume, assume as a rule of thumb, companies issuing shares on problems. And yes, they're trying to fund growth, which is why they list. So there's a balance between the two. Once again, earnings per share, headline earnings per share versus dilute those two measures. Um, Earnings per share is everything. It's literally what's on the bottom. Headline earnings per share is a JC requirement it's based on FRS. We, ex we exclude one-source numbers. Um, it's simple. It, headline earnings per share is trying to give you an estimate of what the core earnings are. If, if no random events happen, if there are no black swan events, you know, there's no impairments, you have no flood, no whatever, then the headline earnings per share would equal the earnings per share. But the world isn't perfect, so watch the two. And it, my, my only advice in these two, because there's arguments for both of them being just as important as the other, is if there's a major difference between the two, understand what that difference is. And then we touched on dilute earnings per share. It simply takes into account the full dilution. Continuing versus discontinuing, companies, uh, particularly listed groups, are, are, are very keen on buying and then selling whole businesses. And the moment... It's very convenient for a company to to make a bad purchase decision, decide to sell that subsidiary which they're accounting for, and then just to classify it as discontinuing. It's a very convenient way of hiding um, their bad decision-making process. My point being is if there is a major, major difference between continuing, or actually if, if a business has got a discontinuing EPS, you have to start asking questions, why? Um, Continuing EPS, though, is on the same line as headline earnings per share. It's really trying to give you an indication of the underlying earnings going forward, what it's going to look like. Then we can touch on efficiency ratios. There are, once again, there are millions of efficiency ratios. I'm going to give you an example to understand what I mean by an efficiency ratio. 
There are two companies, A and B, both made a hundred rand profit, net profit, after tax, everything. Company A used a hundred rand to make a hundred rand. Company B used a thousand rand to make a hundred rand. Which would you rather be? It's, it's simple. That is a, company A used less money to make the same amount of money. Hence, it's more efficient. The business spins better. And that's, that's why we talk about a return on equity. If, if company A was, the, was you and you were, uh, uh, you were running your hamburger business and 100 Rand was your capital that you put in and you made 100 Rand, you've just made 100 Rand return on equity. Simple. It's profit divided by equity. You own the whole business. That's equity. Um, company B is only making about a 10%. Uh, you, also, you also get uh, efficiency ratios in terms of assets. Uh, simple. It's profits divided by assets, you can do net assets, average assets, you know, fixed versus uh, non-current. Don't want to go into that, just understand that re return on equity is, is, is largely a benchmark. Return on assets just shows you, shows you efficiency of use of, of, of the balance sheet, um, but it doesn't take into account the financial leverage. Return on equity does. We're going to touch on return on equity a little bit later. Well, a little bit later when you're right here. Uh, return on equity is, is, is I cannot emphasize how much return on equity is critical. It is, it is the interaction between the income statement and the balance sheet. Not just the balance sheet, but particularly from, from a perspective of being a shareholder, it's, it's your equity. It's how your business has been funded. The higher the return on equity, the higher the growth. Think of compounding. Don't think of it as a business. Think of it as, as if you're a shareholder, you put your money in, into, that, into that business, but pretend that business was actually a savings account at the bank. And now, now it's a savings account at the bank, you have interest. That year on year compounds and you reinvest your interest. Obviously, the higher that interest rate, the better. Return on equity is that interest rate. It's, it is profits compounding onto the balance sheet, allowing the business to expand, reinvest profits into operations. The higher the return on equity, the, the better. It is simple. It, it is affected by financial leverage. It is affected by operating leverage. If they have large cash balances um, that are earning you know, low interest and they aren't paying it out to shareholders, your, your, your um, equity is going to be inflated, so your return on equity is going to be lower. It takes into account all of these effects, um, hence showing you how, if there was just one, one ratio, showing the efficiency, and effectiveness, and profitability of a business, it would be return on equity. So the big picture. Remember, look at the income statement, understand the sales and the price drivers. Sales, what's driving volumes? Price, can, are they a price taker, or are they, are they, can, can they set their price? Then grasp the costs, the costs uh, particularly the risks and the leverage in these. Um, because that, that is a measure of risk in the business. Um, then make sure to take a note of the dilution or the shareholder risk. Uh, because as great as growing profits are, does it trickle down to the shareholders or the greater, is there greater dilution, i.e. as often a, um, a, a symptom of an overly acquisitive business. Finally, the return on equity is a key measure. It all, it all comes down to return on equity. Warning signs. You have a business with high operating leverage but volatile revenues. Um, high operate, this, this is a classic symptom of mining. Everyone knows mining is high risk. But let, let's not put it in specific terms. Let's put it in theoretical terms. Because your revenue is volatile, it's going to be up and down and all over the place. But because you have high leverage, your revenues fluctuations will multiply, will be exaggerated by your net profit fluctuations. Be careful of growing competition, which is uh, demonstrated by thinning margins. Return on equity below industry norms. Always compare it versus other listed comparatives. Um, you want to be investing in the best, in the most competitive interest rates in banks, so why not invest in the most competitive return on equity in the market? Uh, then also be very careful of uh, heavy and future shareholder uh, dilution. Um, you know, have guys, are there a lot of outstanding sh uh, shares that the guys have promised, be it to management, be it to the board, be it to future acquisitions or current acquisitions or profit warranties or, or whatever? It's really going to smack you. 
Just be careful of these warning signs. So, in conclusion, and I, I know it's been a it's been a bit of a long uh, chat we've had you on this webinar, but I just want to leave you with three. It, there's there's only really three things you want sustainably growing profits. Sustainably measures risk. Growing shows trajectory and profits. You don't want losses. There's plenty of companies out there. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're open to questions there.